All right, everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Comstock video seminar. Um, I'm looking forward to uh, a very interesting session with two good old friends, both of them very good and very old ones, um, Nicola Modé and Eric Packett. Um, before I introduce the first speaker, I'm going to explain again um, how things work here. So we're going to have uh, two talks. Uh, each of them will have 20 minutes uh, to present, and then we have 10 minutes for questions uh, afterwards. However, you can already start asking your questions during the talk uh, by typing them into the chat. And then you do it like this. You type in capital letters the word question, followed by your actual question. It makes it a bit easier to spot. Sometimes people pick it up during the talk. Most of the time, it's just nice to have a, a few questions already there when we start with the Q&A. And then um, you know, they, they will read some out, of, uh, out some of these questions, answer them, and then we can also have people ask additional questions um, through the microphone. In the middle, we're going to have a break uh, with breakout rooms for 10 minutes, where Dominic will put you in some random room uh, with a handful of other people, something like this, and you can have a chat with them. And then we're going to have the second talk. Um, we're not going to have any seminars for quite a while after this. And I will explain uh, at the end why that is and what you can do instead. It's also not too bad. Um, so you better enjoy this one. So, um, Nicola, you want to start sharing your screen while I introduce you. So our first speaker is uh, Nicola Modé, professor of computer science at, at Lipsis in Paris. So. It's one of the universities in Paris that changed their name, like other people change their socks, but it's the one, if you have like the Paris here, it's the one that's somewhere located over there. That's the one where he's at, and he's worked in a number of different topics in computational social choice, um, including voting, for example, particularly uh, fair division, uh, and today also kind of um, fits into this topic. So the title is Swap Dynamics in Single Peak Housing Markets. Uh, Nicola, the floor is yours. Just in case, do not forget to unmute yourself once you are ready to speak. Up, unmute, and share again. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Ule. Hello, everyone. So, indeed, I'm going to talk about swap dynamics in uh, single picked uh, housing markets. This is a uh, joint work with uh, Aurélie, Simon and uh, Param, who are respectively in uh, Paris, uh, Amsterdam and uh, Paris. And uh, we have a paper recently uh, published in uh, Chambers uh, about this uh, topic. So uh, I'm going to introduce uh, housing markets. I guess uh, most of you know uh, what this is about uh, before moving to swap dynamics uh, more specifically. So house market uh, is a very simple setting, maybe one of the most basic one in, in uh, fair division resource allocation where you have N agents, same number of uh, resources and each agent has uh, one resource and initially holds uh, one, which is the difference with a uh, house allocation uh, setting. Agents have a uh, linear order representing preferences. So an instance would be something like this, where you have agent one preferring uh, house A over B over C and so on, and agent two preferring E over D, uh, C and so on. The underlying uh, allocation here is the, the initial allocation, so the initial endowment uh, of agents. So in this uh, setting, the compelling mechanism is a TTC, top trading cycle, which also I guess most of you know, but I'll briefly uh, recall what this is about. So in a TTC, TTC you have a bipartite uh, graph with on one side agents, on the other side um, resources or houses here. Agents will point to their preferred uh, resource and houses will point to agents which uh, hold them. So you get a graph like that. And once you get that, you can implement uh, the different uh, 
cycle. So it could be that a cycle is a self uh, cycle. You can do that in any different order. It doesn't make any difference. And you do that until you allocate all the, all the houses. Once you've done that, you get an outcome, which is in the core. And so TTC has very nice properties. It is indeed rational, so no a chance we get something which is not at least as good uh, as what uh, he had at the beginning, so before entering the mechanism. It's also Pareto optimal and it's uh, strategy proof, so no agent has an interest to, to deviate and misrepresent um, his preferences. Uh, and not only that, uh, it's, uh, it's actually the only mechanism guaranteeing that, and this uh, has been proven by um, uh, Ma. So in the general domain, uh, we know that it's the only mechanism guaranteeing uh, simultaneously uh, these uh, three properties. In a single peak domain, uh, again, I, uh, I guess most of you know what this is about. Uh, if you don't, I think uh, it's, uh, it's, it's best uh, described uh, graphically. Uh, you have a common axis. So for instance, here you, you could have uh, the size of the different houses. So a, B, C, D could be the smallest on the left hand side. And then moving to the biggest, uh, largest on the, on the right hand side. So if you picture your preferences, the highest, the better, then it must be the case that you have a single uh, peak in this picture. So for instance, this uh, ordering would be single peak. If your preferred house is B, then the second next one uh, can only be A or C. In that case, it's A and then it, 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 it's C here and so on. If you have something like that, it's not single peak because you have these two peaks uh, that you see on the picture. So in this uh, restricted domain, uh, it may not be the case uh, any longer that um, TTC is the only mechanism guaranteeing all these uh, nice properties that I showed. And, and indeed, uh, Sophie Bate recently um, came up with a very nice procedure, which is called the uh, crawler. And it goes like that. I will briefly explain how it, um, it works. So you first uh, sort uh, the agents according to the single peaked axis. Uh, with respect to their initial endowment. And then you do different uh, screening from left uh, to right. And in a screening, you will ask uh, agents whether they would like to pick either their current or a smaller house, I will illustrate uh, right after, or if they prefer to crawl along the axis, crawling meaning that they would get uh, the next um, house on the, on the right, available house on the right. And you do that until you allocate all the all the houses. So, for instance, here, so we order the different agents um, according again to the to the common axis and to the initial endowment. So you first have um, agent two and agent, uh, agent five and so on. So you ask agent two, would you like to crawl? And and he says uh, yes, I'm happy because then I would get B and it's better for me. And then agent five would also be happy to crawl because um, he would get C and this is better for agent uh, five. And moving on to agent three, agent three would say, and I'm quite happy with my house because that's actually my preferred house. I will take this one. And so the, the first screening, you get something like that and you repeat on the second screening, you get something like that. I'll move to the third um, screening where you get something um, more interesting happening here. So A and B were again happy to, to crawl, but and here agent one would prefer to pick um, a smaller uh, house, uh, namely uh, house A. And it, in that case, you have a trading cycle of size uh, three, meaning that two would get a resource uh, B and five would get house E and one would get a. You implement this, so one gets A, and again, you keep uh, doing those uh, screenings until you allocate all the goods. Okay, this is the final allocation. 
So crawler and TTC may return different um, outcomes and that was uh, shown by uh, Bade in our paper. So it's not the same mechanism, but still um, she, uh, she showed that uh, it has the same very nice property. So in this restricted domain, indeed TTC is not uh, any longer the, the unique uh, mechanism guaranteeing individual rationality, parity optimality, and strategy proof proofness. It's even better because in terms of uh, strategy proofness, uh, it has a guarantee of, of being obviously strategy proof. I will not get into all the details here, but it's uh, even stronger. So you can check those references here if you want to know a bit more about that. Okay, so these are very nice um, uh, mechanism, but they are of course centralized. Uh, potentially they can require a long trading cycle. So the idea is to look at um, simplest in a sense uh, mechanism and, and the family I will talk about are swap dynamics based on very simple swaps. So swaps uh, being bilateral exchanges among uh, two agents. So that's very, very simple. And we'll see what we can do with that and, and what kind of properties we can keep or not uh, in this setting. So the ba basic notions are uh, the following ones. So as I said, uh, you only have exchange um, among uh, two agents. It has to be mutually uh, beneficial. So of course it will be uh, IR uh, by construction. And you do that until you reach a stable uh, allocation. So of course it does not properly define um, a mechanism here because you still have to say how uh, agents will meet each other, how these uh, encounters will happen. And this is done via uh, something that we called uh, in the paper uh, selection heuristics which is uh, again, the way these agents meet. So you can have different ones in mind. Uh, I'll just uh, cite a few of them here um, as examples. So the, uh, one of them could be to just select uh, uniformly uh, at random a pair of agents. You could organize um, a bit more maybe fairly and, and um, say that you have a round robin ordering uh, between the agents, either between pairs or, or between agents, you can have um, variants. Or you could do things a bit more uh, complicated. For instance, you could look at agents uh, which would be uh, the worst of and try to favor them themselves and so on. If you do that, you, you see that um, you will um, actually need to get uh, a bit more information. So we, we called um, um, selection heuristics, which are just based on the history of, of, previ of previous deals, sorry, uh, history-based heuristics. So in that case, the two first ones uh, would be history-based, but the last one, of course, would need to access uh, at least some part of uh, preferences so this is not history based. So what are the properties of this, um, of this uh, mechanism? So in terms of uh, strategy proofness, um, maybe it's not very surprising, but it's not strategy proof. So of course, uh, I cannot say something that general because you could design um, a selection heuristic, uh, which we would only pick uh, again and again, the same two agents. And that would be, of course, a strategy proof. But as long as you allow uh, some sele selection heuristic, which is not biased and which uh, is actually required to, to get Pareto optimality, uh, then you can show that you cannot ensure uh, strategy pr proofness. So no history-based uh, SWAT dynamics can be both strategy proof and Pareto optimal. So for instance, here to get the intuition agent one here, um, has initially uh, house C, and you see that agent three would only uh, deal, uh, so he has a B and he would only deal with A. So agent one has an incentive to actually lie in the first uh, encounter to get A and to, in the end, uh, swap with uh, agent three so that he would get B in the end instead of C. And to, to do that, uh, agent one would just need to know that the, the dynamics would at some point uh, let him meet uh, agent three. 
Okay, this is the only thing that uh, is uh, required. Okay, so this is strategy proofness and Pareto optimality. In terms of Pareto optimality, um, of course, obviously, if we take the general domain, swap, uh, swap uh, dynamics cannot ensure Pareto optimality because you may need longer trading cycles as uh, this is uh, illustrated here. But the good news is that in the single peak domain, swaps are sufficient. And this is something that we remarked uh, couple of years ago and uh, the very basic idea is that uh, if uh, you have a swap stable allocation which is not PO then you would get a situation like that that would be the base case and that violate uh, one uh, necessary condition for single thickness which is worst uh, restrictedness and by proceeding by induction you can show that um, it will it will be true in in general so in single peak domain, any sequence of uh, swaps will reach a Pareto optimal allocation, which is uh, good news. Uh, perhaps uh, a bit more surprising is the fact that uh, you will not actually reach all the Pareto optimal allocations. So for instance, here, if you start with the underlying allocation, you cannot reach the boxed allocation. So you can, you're sure to reach a Pareto, but not all of them can be reached by uh, swaps starting from an initial allocation. Then a natural question is the relation to this swap dynamics and the two uh, mechanisms that I presented at the beginning, namely uh, crawler and TTC. And here uh, you can show that you can actually mic mic uh, the trading cycles that you have in crawler and TTC um, by swaps. So you can do that, meaning that uh, these outcomes are reachable by, by swaps. So for instance, if you remember the example that I gave for um, the crawler, then the, the last, um, in the case that you have a, a trading cycle, the, the last agent, so the one uh, picking the smaller uh, houses can act as a sort of um, hub, let's say, and then you can incrementally uh, implement different swaps and get the same um, trading cycle in a sense. And uh, the same sort of uh, construction uh, will also work for TTC. So to recap, uh, in the end, what we get, what we get is uh, something like that. Um, you get um, that swap stable uh, location reachable from some uh, initial allocation are uh, Pareto optimal. You cannot reach all of them, so you have this uh, region here, and cr crawler and TTC are outcomes which ca can be reached by swap uh, dynamics. And then a, nat a natural question is, so I, I said that uh, in, gen in the general domain, you do not have this guarantee of reaching a Pareto optimal allocation. In the single picked one, you do. Uh, the natural question is whether there is something in between, whether you can get something larger maybe than a single peak domain. And for instance, you can uh, think of single peakness on trees and things like that. And in the paper, we show that uh, it's not the case. So it's a maximal in a sense, uh, meaning that uh, you cannot get a larger domain than the single picked uh, domain ensuring that uh, you reach a Pareto optimal location. So it's not a proper characterization, but, but still it shows that you cannot get something larger, larger than um, single thickness. Okay. In the few um, remaining minutes, I'll talk a bit about the quality of outcomes that um, you can reach with this uh, swap dynamics. So we, in, in this work, we used two metrics. One of them is the average rank and the other one is the minimum rank or border utilities, if you like, of the houses that you obtain. And we we got two types of results. First, sort of price of uh, kind of results and uh, some experiments to show under different culture how it works and so on. So in terms of the price of uh, results, so we used both uh, 
price of anarchy is also classic notion, so work, worst case um, ratio between the worst table and the social welfare optimum. But also maybe more relevant uh, here for our uh, setting is the price of dynamics, what we coined uh, the price of dynamics, which is for a given family of dynamics, the ratio between the best and the worst um, stable outcome that you can reach from a given uh, allocation, a given initial allocation by the procedure belonging to this family, in our case, swap dynamics. And you can get uh, instances like that, where, for instance, here you have two Pareto optimal allocation, the two boxed one, the gray and, and the white. <clears throat> These are two different Pareto optimal allocation. These two Pareto optimal allocation can be reached by uh, the initial underlying allocation. So this shows, and, and if you take the ratio in terms of the average rank, it's, uh, it's two. So this shows that the price of anarchy and price of dynamics is two in the single peak domain. In terms of experiments, I'll very briefly mention a couple of uh, results and, uh, and then I'll point to the paper for more details. But uh, we investigated the efficiency and fairness again using the same metrics, the length of the process, number of swaps, the difference between uh, the different selection heuristics and a comparison with TTC and the crawler. We did that with two types of uh, culture. One is the impartial culture. So meaning that we draw uniformly um, at random among all the different single picked uh, on the rings. The other one is a bit different. You first pick um, a pick I C K. Oh, yes, select a pick, and and then you 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 chose either on the right or, or left hand side, and uh, it's called uniform pick uh, single pick, and it gives quite different distribution in, in the end. So just to give you an example here, um, if I had to maybe highlight uh, one one result of this. Um, table this uh, graph here you can see so at the very bottom you have uh, TTC and cr crawler which are actually very similar even though they can potentially sometimes give different outcomes so this is in terms of the mi minimum rank and you can see here that you have the um, swap using uniform uh, selection of deals and if you take this um, uh, this uh, selection heuristics that I called um, priority to the worst of, you can see that you have a, quite a large difference. So in terms of um, empirical uh, price of dynamics, you can see that even uh, restraining yourself, constraining yourself to the swap dynamics, you can do much better in terms of what you can reach. Of course, it's not a fair comparison uh, with TTC and crawler because they are not at all uh, designed to optimize these uh, metrics, but it, it's all it's good to to see how they they behave in that respect. So main message is that swaps are actually quite good. They they give overall uh, quite um, satisfying results, both in terms of the average and the minimum minimum rank. You can also see that the culture that you consider makes quite um, quite a big difference sometimes. And this is um, due to the fact that, as I said, the, the type of uh, distribution that you get is uh, quite different. Quite different, And uh, we tried to measure a bit that. And it uh, showed that um, one of them is much more diverse uh, than the other one, which means intuitively that there, are, there is more room for swaps. OK, I'll conclude uh, by saying that, of course, uh, there are um, plenty of uh, questions re remaining. Uh, one challenging question that uh, remains is to actually characterize um, in the single peak domain uh, mechanism, which are um, individually rational, Pareto optimal, and strategic proof. Uh, we had some discussion with uh, Sophie Bade about that and some initial progress, but it looks quite uh, challenging. And on the swap dynamics, I, I also wanted to mention that there are quite a few uh, papers recently, so somehow related to um, what I presented, but where you assume that you have an underlying uh, topology, a graph constraining the exchange, 
and uh, so different papers i just uh, cite some of them here in what i showed i assume that all the different um, pairs of agents could meet without any constraints and that's it thank you very much uh, everyone this is the reference uh, of our paper thank you very much um i'd like to suggest that we all unmute ourselves for a round of applause and then we already have um a couple of uh, questions in the chat um Paolo, I don't know whether yours, uh, you, you want to maybe read it out or? Yeah, it. So, yes, maybe. Um, so it's about, hello. So it's about that uh, when you decide the turn function, who to meet next, I wonder if agents can take advantage of the knowledge of what's happening in the future uh, strategically. Since this is a swap, I'm not sure. What, what do you think? Thanks. Yes, in, in general, they can. So we assume that uh, they, they know, actually, they, they have to know very little about uh, what is happening. For instance, uh, in terms of strategy proofness, they would just need to know that the, um, the selection heuristic is not biased in the sense that it would prevent some agents from encountering forever. Uh, things like that but more generally you're right they could uh, take uh, advantage of, of this if they know for instance the exact uh, coming uh, sequence yeah. thank you okay so if there are more questions you can you can raise your hands or you can type something in the chat in the meantime i will fill um the dead air with my own question, uh, which I had typed in before you started talking about experiments. Um, so I was wondering, do you have anything about the maximal lengths of swap sequences? So not experimentally established, but somehow some upper bounds. Yeah, so the very, well, naive one, of course, is that it will be quadratic because uh, each swap is uh, mutually beneficial. So there is no, uh, very high upper bound. Uh, we, maybe we could get uh, something more precise. Empirically, I did not show, but we, we have results uh, showing uh, the number of deals uh, which are involved. Uh, but um, yeah, so we, we did not uh, look into very precise uh, bounds. Um, yeah, because it's, um, it's quadratic anyway. So maybe uh, I'm not sure that you can exactly construct the maximal sequence, but um, yeah. should not be far. Yeah. Do we have other questions? Is it possible? Is there an, uh, I don't know, was, was it a very difficult uh, thing to prove or is it once you see it a uh, simple thing this, that uh, that you can't go beyond the single peak domain, which at first sounds surprising. Like, can you really not just like add one person who is not aligned with the single peak thing or something like this? No, um, it's, uh, it's, no it's not uh, straightforward. I think it's uh, one of the most involved uh, thing in the paper. Yes, no, it's not straightforward. Um, I don't think I could give an intuition like that. It's a kind of construction where you show indeed that uh, as long as, as you have um, a domain uh, just a little bit larger, then you can construct an, an instance where it will um, happen that you cannot reach uh, the situation. A bit similar to some of the uh, results that uh, uh, we had together with uh, Jan and colleagues. So it's like oh, you add yeah. one agent that doesn't uh, do the right thing, and that. Uh, yes, yes, I think so. Yes, Simon. No, yeah, I was actually about to say that indeed only one agent is enough to to show the thing. So yeah. we we have a nice picture in the paper uh, to show the construction. It's it's easy to understand from the field. Very nice and colorful. It's not easy, but once you see the picture, it's it's easy. It's not that kind of thing. Let's say. <laughs> okay, last chance. Uh, any further questions? 
just uh, raise your hand or say in the chat, I have a question, or even unmute yourself and just start talking. Um, if not, then uh, thank you very much once more for this very nice talk. Thanks for the invitation. And then I'm, we're going to move to the uh, to the break. So in a moment, um, Dominic will uh, press a button, and then you see on your screen something. Would you like to go to this breakout room? And then the suggestion is that you say yes, and you will meet some people there, and you can have a chat with them, have a coffee, and we'll start again in around 10 minutes time. All right, then uh, welcome back uh, for the second half of uh, this session of the seminar. Our second speaker is Eric Packett, um, Professor of Philosophy at the University of Maryland. Eric is a logician um, working on a number of topics in logic, also including things such as epistemic game theory and also some social choice voting theory judgment aggregation, and he's going to talk about expansion consistency in voting today. Eric, go ahead. All right. Uh, great. Thank you very much. Uh, and I thank my old friend, Ula, for, for inviting me to come here. So um, yeah, so this is joint work with uh, Wes Holliday and Sam uh, Zahedin. Um, and what we want to look at um, is uh, expansion consistency in voting. Um, so we're going to start with the very well-known theorem of Sen, um, and by expansion consistency, we mean uh, Sen's uh, uh, gamma condition. Um, so, uh, you know, if C is a choice function, this just assigns to any non-empty subset um, some um, uh, the choices that, that are made given the menu A. Um, and then you have this well-known characterization that if C satisfies alpha and gamma, that's equivalent to it to this choice function being rationalizable. Okay, and this is uh, maximal element rationalizable. So if you if you satisfy alpha and gamma, then there must exist a binary relation on X on the set of alternatives such that the choices you make are not dominated by any other choice. Um, and what we want to do is we want to look at this gamma condition in the context of uh, voting for, for voting methods. Um, okay, and I'll say more about uh, this, this expansion, uh, the, the gamma condition um, in, in just a second. Um, so let me first just remind you a little bit about um, just some notation that we're going to use. Um, a, a, expansion uh, consistency expansion is going to be an axiom in which the candidates might change in the profile. So we're going to be considering profiles with possibly different candidates in them. Um, so we need to set up things in a variable election uh, scenario. So let's just start by fixing uh, an infinite set of voters and an infinite set of candidates. Um, uh, then any profile is going to be a profile on a finite set of voters and a finite uh, non-empty set of candidates. Um, and a profile is just the usual thing. It assigns to every voter. Um, in this case, we're assuming strict linear orders um, over the candidates. Um, that's not, well, okay, uh, let, let's just make, to simplify things, we're gonna assume strict linear orders over the candidates. Um, so given a profile P, V of P is the set of voters in P, and X of P is the set of candidates in P, okay? And then as usual, we'll write P of I or uh, P sub I uh, for the ranking associated with voter I. All right, then a voting method is very much like a choice uh, rule or a choice function. A voting method is a function um, uh, on the domain of all profiles, such that for any profile uh, uh, P, um, uh, F, uh, uh, F of P is a non-empty subset of the set of candidates. So the menu of options is the set of all candidates. To define expansion in the context of voting, um, this is how we do it. So uh, given a voting method F, this satisfies expansion if you give me any, two, any profile P, and then any two subsets of the candidates such that their union is all of the candidates. So take Y and Y prime, those are sets of candidates. 
um, where Y union Y prime is everybody in that profile, um, then uh, what, what do we want to satisfy? Well, you look at the winners when you restrict to Y. So this notation right here says, take the profile and restrict that profile to just the candidates in Y. And similarly here, P sub Y prime, that's the, that you take the profile P and you restrict it to the candidates in Y prime. So if you're a winner when you restrict to Y and you're a winner when you restrict to Y prime, then you better be a winner overall. Okay, so that's just the expansion um, axiom in the context of voting. Now, let me just uh, very uh, quickly do a real quick digression to give just a little bit of a warning about how we're understanding expansion and these choice consistency axioms in the context of, of voting methods. Um, so, uh, you know, following SEND, we can define a CCR or a collective choice rule. Um, this is just going to be a function um, such that for every profile P, F of P is an asymmetric binary relation on X of P. You can think of it as like the defeat relation on the set of candidates. Um, and you can also define a functional collective choice rule. This is really kind of the setting that, um, well, Sen explored it. Um, it was also sort of set up this way in, in, in Arrow originally. Um, and this is going to be a function f that assigns to each profile. Now it's, uh, this is the most abstract setting. This is just going to be a choice function on the set of candidates. Okay. Um, so an FCCR, a functional collective choice rule, will satisfy expansion, expansion if for all fo uh, profiles P, F of P satisfies expansion. The choice rule that you assign to every profile actually satisfies expansion. Okay. Now, from this setting, um, given a collective choice rule, um, there are two uh, ways you can associate, you can induce an FCCR given a collective choice rule. One is a global choice FCCR. Um, so what is that? For any profile P and any set Y, um, uh, uh, yeah, uh, for any set Y, um, the, the choices you make, um, this will be the set of all Y such that um, there is no Z in Y that uh, dominates X according to F of P. Or you can do the local choice rule so that when you're making a choice from among the candidates in Y, okay, so when you fix this, this set Y, the choices you're actually going to make, you're going to ignore all the candidates outside of Y. Okay, so the distinction here is um, this is supposed to be highlighted blue. Here we're looking at F of P. Here we're looking at F of P restricted to Y. Okay. Um, and given a single collective choice rule, um, uh, 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 the global choice and the local choice might actually be different, okay? And this is probably fairly well known, but if you just take Borda, for example, um, uh, uh, here's our original profile P. We have this subset XAY. Um, global Borda, um, when you look at Y is actually going to select X and that's because X has the greatest border score. I'm not gonna go through the calculations, but that should be, seem pretty obvious. Um, but when we restrict to Y, um, it turns out that uh, Y has the greatest border score in this restriction right here. So the global border collective choice rule is gonna be different in general from the local border collective choice rule. Um, now, um, uh, global choice FCCRs always satisfy expansion, <laughs> right? Because I'm assuming that there's this acyclic relation or this well-defined relation that's defining the choices. So obviously they're going to satisfy expansion and alpha. Local choice FCCRs may not satisfy expansion. Um, and then uh, there are some well-known impossibility results and, and we have some as, as well. No reasonable CCRs who um, uh, uh, have a local choice FCCR satisfying alpha. Alpha is generally too strong. Now, our definition of expansion for voting methods is very similar to this local choice version rather than this global choice version. Okay, and that's because we're uh, restricting to the set of candidates when we look at F applied to those, those different profiles. All right, so that's um, uh, how we might state expansion in the, for uh, voting methods. 
And um, okay, so let me let me talk about the uh, motivation for expansion and voting methods. And there's this nice quote from uh, Boards about why you might want to impose expansion in the context of voting. So he says, first, it seems intuitively right that if X is a winner in both A and A prime, which for us, it was Y and Y prime, um, then it should stay a winner in A union A prime. Okay. Um, second, it limits the manipul manipulability of the SCF, which for us is what we're calling a voting method, in that it implies that if X is a winner in A, and if B is formed by adding to A new alternatives, no matter whether they are winning or losing, such that X is a winner in some subset of B that contains the new alternatives, then X is still a winner in B. Okay, and so in particular, he says this means that one cannot turn X into a loser, introducing to all, uh, uh, new alternatives to which X does not lose in duels. Now, boards didn't really explore uh, this this part as much in in, in this paper, but this very naturally suggests um, a, a variation on expansion, uh, which what you might call binary expansion. Okay, so this this focusing on duels. Um, uh, uh, so, so in, in expansion here, you have these two sets, A and A prime. Um, so binary expansion is you just restrict attention to one of the sets to be of size two, okay? Um, so modulo, modulo alpha expansion is equivalent to binary expansion. Uh, so you can replace expansion by uh, uh, binary expansion and sense representation theorem. Um, but what we want to look at is binary expansion in the context of voting methods. Okay, so here's expansion right here, and now here's binary expansion. So take two sets of candidates, y and y prime, um, such that y union y prime is the set of all candidates. Y has only two elements in it, just two elements in it. Um, then uh, uh, if you're a winner in f of p restricted to y, and you're a winner in this uh, profile where you have just two alternatives, just two candidates, then you must be a winner overall. Okay, and in other work, uh, we've uh, uh, we called binary expansion uh, strong stability for winners, um, and it's, it's very natural when you when you look at it this way. Um, what does this boil down to? Um, assuming that your voting method behaves like majority rule on uh, two candidate elections. So assuming that it's a majority rule on two candidate elections, then this just boils down to strong stability for winners. For all profiles P, for all uh, candidates A and B, if A is a winner without B in the election, okay, so A is a winner here, and um, the margin for A over B, this is just the number of people that rank A over B minus the number of people that rank B over A, is greater than or equal to zero. So you would be a winner here, assuming F boils down to majority rule on two candidate elections, then you better be a winner overall. So you're a sort of a stable winner. Okay. So binary expansion really is just strong stability for winners under the natural assumption that on two candidate elections, um, uh, you behave like majority rule. Okay, so um, both beat bath and minimax, for example, violate binary expansion. I'm assuming most of us um, uh, are familiar with these voting methods. So without A in, um, uh, uh, in the uh, election, um, we have a perfect cycle between B, D, and C. So of course, everybody's going to win. A comes into the election. I don't have an answer for that. And uh, Alexa is talking to me. Um, A comes into the election. B is majority preferred to A. Um, uh, but A is going to lose in minimax. Um, A, A's, uh, uh, um, um, uh, sorry, um, B is going to lose in minimax because A ends up winning. Um, and B will also lose according to beat path. Uh, because A actually defeats B according to beat path, because there's this indirect path back to B that has a stronger weight than the direct defeat of B over A. So both uh, uh, beat path and minimax violate binary expansion. Um, so there are a number of methods that do satisfy expansion. Um, uh, uh, an example is top cycle. Uh, this satisfies expansion. Um, I think it's well known that that uncovered set also uh, satisfies expansion. A voting method that uh, Wes and I have been um, interested in, split cycle, um, also satisfies uh, expansion. 
Um, there are some methods um, that violate binary expansion, uh, sorry, that satisfy binary expansion, but violate expansion. Interestingly, banks um, uh, satisfies this pro property. It satisfies binary expansion, depending, this depends a little bit on how you define banks for weak tournaments. So you gotta be a little bit careful there, but, but in any case, it violates expansion. And then a number of methods violate uh, binary expansion, plurality, Borda, instant runoff, um, uh, Copeland, and so on. Okay, rank pairs, beat path. They violate binary expansion. Okay, um, now if we look at the methods that violate binary expansions and the methods that satisfy expansion, one thing we notice is that these methods tend to be a little bit less resolute than, than, than the other methods, okay? The, um, um, so um, several of the methods violating binary expansion actually satisfy the strong uh, resoluteness property, um, asymptotic um, resolvability. So asymptotic resolvability says in the limit as the number of voters goes to infinity, the proportion of pro profiles with a unique winner before any tie breaking goes to one. Okay. Now um, for margin based methods, asymptotic resolvability is equivalent to this property right here, quasi resoluteness. So for any profile P, if there are no ties in the margins of any of the candidates, then you must select a single winner, okay? Um, so that's what quasi, so you, you don't select a single winner all the time, but you do it in this very natural case when all of the margins in the margin graph are actually um, um, unique. So you, you, don't, you don't have any ties in the margins. Um, the, the known methods that satisfy binary expansion um, violate asymptotic resolvability or quasi-resoluteness, okay? Um, and just to kind of illustrate what's, what's going on here, um, so there's this nice paper by Matthew Harrison Trainer um, that allows us to sort of estimate the probability or, or the average size of the winning sets as the number of voters goes off to infinity, okay? So you get kind of an estimate of what margin graphs you actually get when you have very large number of, n numbers of voters, okay? So for split cycle, when there are three candidates, um, it, it does actually always select a single winner. Uncovered set in top cycle is slightly more than, than a single winner on average. Um, but as the number of candidates grows, you see with top cycle, you get this, well, this, this known fact that top, or sorry, that top cycle is eventually going to select all the candidates as the number of candidates grows. Okay, um, uh, and so an uncovered set also grows um, here, okay? The important bit is top cycle, this number is not one here, right? So it's close to one, but it's not one, which means since this is an average of the size of the winning set, that as the voter, as you have infinitely many voters, you, you actually aren't selecting a single winner every single time, okay? Um, so here's the cost of quasi-resoluteness. Um, so, so the theorem is that there is no anonymous and neutral voting method um, that satisfies binary expansion and quasi-resoluteness. Okay, so you just, you just can't find one. Um, and this was proved, um, we have a, a, a human proof, uh, but that uses an additional uh, uh, assumption about voting methods. Um, so this is actually proved using SAT. So to get this in, in complete generality, this is a, a, a SAT proof. Okay, so what's the moral? Making room for tie-breaking runoff lotteries, et cetera, um, is both necessary and sufficient to find voting methods um, that satisfy binary expansion. Okay. Um, so that's the, 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 the main result I wanted to talk about. Um, in the last uh, few minutes, let me just say a little bit about frequencies of violations. Um, this is a very natural question. Um, you know, we have some voting methods that violate binary expansion. Um, so you might, defenders of those methods might say, yeah, well, that's all well and good, but it's just very unlikely that you'll violate binary expansion. Okay. So we're going to say that a profile P witnesses a violation of binary expansion for F if there are candidates A and B, um, such that uh, when you remove B, um, uh, um, uh, 
f of the winners here um, uh, intersection the winners theirs is not a subset of f applied to the entire profile. Okay, i.e., a is a winner when uh, b is removed. Um, a the margin of a over b is greater than or equal to zero, but a is not actually a winner. Okay, um, in the full profile. So if we look at the frequency of violations. Um, you get kind of a lot with plurality. I mean, it's around uh, 0.4. This is with IC, the impartial culture. Um, but most of the violations, at least for beat path and minimax, are quite small. So there's relatively few um, uh, uh, violations, at least for five candidates here. I mean, I'm just giving you a sample of the experiments that one could run. Um, but we actually think this is not the right way to compare voting methods. Um, when, um, in terms of um, uh, uh, how frequent they, they uh, uh, violate a particular axiom. Suppose we want to use an axiom to discriminate between one method F1 that satisfies the axiom and another method F2 that violates the axiom. Rather than looking at the overall frequency of violation for F2, um, what we should be asking is, in the profiles on which F1 and F2 actually disagree, they give you actual different answers. With what frequency does F2 violate the axiom? So when they disagree, we want to know, are they disagreeing for bad reasons, right? That's one way to actually think about it, OK? Um, and when we look at this conditional, when we condition on disagreement, then in general, um, uh, these, uh, 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 the frequency of violations of binary expansion goes up. And you know, the striking one here is beat path, which goes up really high. When, when you disagree, when beat path disagrees with split cycle, um, very often it's because you're going to violate uh, binary expansion. Okay. Um, now this graph was produced uh, where I generate, um, uh, oh, by, by the way, so on the X axis here, um, I have the number of candidates. Um, this is when it says 10. Um, this is actually 25,000 profiles generated with 10 voters and 25,000 generated with 11 voters because we wanted a mix of even and odd, um, just so you don't get any effects of, of ties overwhelming what, what the frequencies actually are. Um, so, um, and this was generated using uh, the impartial culture. I generated the profiles using the impartial culture. Um, if you change uh, the probability model, something like IAC um, or, uh, uh, you know, MALOs with, with, a uh, with two reference rankings um, or the EARN model, um, you don't see a, a, a big difference. So we don't see a major drop. Um, um, I mean, we would see a major drop if we look at, for example, like uh, single peak domains and stuff like that, but that, that's, that, that should just be expected. Okay. Um, all right, so uh, let me, I think I'm, uh, yeah, good. <laughs> look at that, perfect timing. It's very rare that I, 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 I perfectly time a talk. Um, okay, so my concluding remarks. Um, Expansion is a very natural axiom to impose on voting methods. Um, uh, our main result is that there's a trade-off between expansion and resoluteness. And I mean, you can kind of see that. Think about the trivial voting method that always elects to everybody. That's a very easy way to satisfy expansion. If you just always elect everybody, then you're guaranteed to satisfy expansion. So it's, it's very natural there. What is a bit more surprising is that we have this result that there's no anonymous and neutral voting method satisfying binary expansion and quasi-resoluteness. Um, and uh, you know, so then it raises a question, are there other impossibility theorems involving binary expansion and other resoluteness axioms? Uh, for example, asymptotic resolvability or other types of uh, resolvability axiom. Um, and just more generally, this is sort of the project that, that Wes and I are very interested in. Um, uh, we're interested in characterizing voting methods that respond, respond reasonably well to both the addition of a new candidate, that's binary expansion. And then in other work, we're looking at voting methods that respond reasonably well to the addition of a new voter. Um, and that's these are the so-called, uh, well, um, uh, uh, positive and negative involvement axioms. And I can, that's a different talk, but I can say more about that. Um, all right, so I think the last thing I wanna say is uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much to you. So let's unmute ourselves for a round of applause.
Okay, and we have already a couple of uh, questions in the chat. Um, I'm going to start with Franz. Do you want to unmute yourself and ask one or both of your questions? Uh, yes, of course. Thank you, Eric, for this talk. Uh, maybe you can forget about my first question because I think it was just a typo on the slide. Uh, so I guess your your rule, your 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 social aggregation rule delivers an acyclic social ordering and not just an asymmetric one. Yeah, As yeah. Because you you need the C of A to be non-empty. Uh, okay, uh, fine. So let's put this uh, technicality aside. Um, so. On an interpretive level, um, when I think of the idea of expansion, I add new options. Uh, then mm. something that I always found a bit weird in, in sense approach, and maybe also you are taking this approach over now, is, is that uh, people, the people in society, they still um, submit the entire preference relations over the full set of alternatives, including those that are not currently feasible. Uh, so what we are expanding is merely the uh, the set of feasible options for society and not the set of options where individuals submit their preferences. Um, on the other hand, I see what's happening if, if we go the opposite way and say and define a choice rule as a function which takes in a profile, which is sort of say on a variable option uh, profile. So for any subset of the set of options, the, uh, and any profiles of relations on that subset delivers a choice from that subset. If we do that, then uh, we get something like independence of alternative, uh, independent, uh, independence of uh, uh, irrelevant alternatives, because we can take binary subsets, and then actually the choice between two options must be a function only of people's preference between th those two options. Do you have any thoughts about that uh, sort of issue and dilemma? Yeah. Yeah, so um, I mean, a couple of things um, um, interpretive. I mean, that's why I gave this little warning at the beginning about the local choice functions versus the global choice functions. Um, and I suppose, you know, one, one way to actually um, um, think about it is, you know, um, uh, you, you rank the all where, where we want to, uh, you know, we, we have a meeting where we want to come up with a ranking over, you know, the candidates we're going to hire or something like that. Um, and then the candidates drop out of the election. Um, and that's what we're kind of um, sort of um, uh, 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 imagining here. Um, now, you're so I, I'm not sure I completely followed everything you were saying at the end about IIA, uh, but in, uh, uh, yes, yeah, so maybe I don't quite understand the point you were making at the end there about, uh, about IIA. Um, could you just say quickly what, what, what you had in mind there? Well, I can, of course, try to repeat, uh, but uh, I, from what you are just saying, I mean, in your example with the candidates, it does make sense that the individuals or the department members submit their preference relation over the huge list of candidates, although at the end they will make a choice only from candidates uh, A to uh, 7, 17, 23. Yeah. Uh, but in, in many real life situations, uh, mm -hmm. you, you will only collect preferences over those options where you actually, which are feasible. The infeasible yeah. options are never being ranked uh, by the individuals and so that's a weirdity in the framework and and the thing about iia i was saying that is that yeah. if you want to remove that weirdity by saying oh the the aggregation rule its input is not the universal preference relations of the individuals but for any subset of the alternatives non-empty maybe yeah. the function can take in the profile of uh, of orders of that subset um, uh, yeah. If you do, if you do such such a notion of an aggregation rule, then you can apply it to the case of binary subsets, and yeah. then you will end up making the making the social choice between two candidates only a function of the individual preferences between those two candidates, which throws away border and all the many rules that that violate yeah, IAA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. 
No, no, I, I, I think that's a good point. I mean, the only thing I'll say is in, in another paper, we, we've explored a weakening of IIA called coherent IIA that's trying to deal a little bit with this, this phenomenon where you're thinking the other way, where you have your ranking and then a new candidate enters the election. And that's, that's a little bit how we think about st stability for winners, how you should respond to what happens when a new candidate enters the election. So um, yeah, um, I, it's not a very good answer, but, but um, I, I think it would take a lot longer than what we have to, uh, to, to hash this out. Okay, let's, let's move on to the next uh, question. Chris, you want to unmute yourself? Yes, um, so all right, I have to start thinking about my question now. I, I was still caught up in the last question. Um, so mm. um, in, in one of the slides, you had some, something calculated for top cycle, uncovered set and split cycle, I think. Yeah, and um, so this impossibility theorem seems to be a trade-off of quasi-resoluteness and this weakened version of gamma. And if I'm not mistaken, all three functions which you listed satisfy not only weakened gamma but also sense gamma. So, uh, oh yes, that's correct. That's correct. Yeah. So I wanted to ask, um, can we do a bit better? Obviously, it's still an impossibility, but can we do a bit better when we don't? Um, take functions which satisfy sense gamma? Um, well, if you satisfy uh, gamma, then you're going to satisfy uh, binary gamma. So if we wanted impossibility, we want to show that you can't actually satisfy binary gamma and, yes. and quasi-resoluteness together. Um, um, is, that, is, that, is that what you were asking? Uh, well, what I was asking was, so I think you ran some numbers. And mm. ran some numbers on case number of violations, basically of quasi resoluteness. Oh, 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 oh! You mean a, 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 a frequency of violations of um, uh, of um, uh, uh, binary expansion? Is that is that, are you are you asking for the frequency of violations of expansion? Is that what you're um, asking for? No, I'm, I'm sorry. If this is taking a bit, could you could you open the slides? I think it's easier with the slides. Um, sorry if this is taking a bit long. Maybe I, I was too imprecise. Um, Let me just do it here. This, this yeah, and there was this one slide where you had this table with UCTC and SC. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that's the the average size of winnings. Ah, okay, it's not the number of violations, I guess. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's and, not the number of violations. It's ah, the I see, average I see. size of the winning set. Mm -hmm. My bad. Mm -hmm. Okay, but but I guess this question is still a valid question in the sense that. If we take some rule that does not satisfy gamma and only satisfies the weakening, um, mm -hmm. does the estimated average size, does it go down? Oh, I see. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I'd have to explore that with banks, for example. Um, uh, uh, I, I I don't know. That's a, that's an interesting. Okay, I, I understand what you're asking. Yeah, I, I don't know the yeah, answer. Yeah, I, I was very imprecise. Sorry for that. Um, yeah. All right, John. Okay, um, Eric, uh, you, the, if I've understood you correctly, although you have an infinite number of potential candidates, you're never choosing from anything but a finite uh, subset of them. Um, That's correct. And, and That's I correct. think, you know, that the reason I raise that is because it's potentially important because Sen's theorem, as stated, is for a finite set X. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, there, there are extensions of that to infinite sets. And mm -hmm. Uh, and also considering alternative rationality conditions, some of which are expansion type uh, conditions. And some of what's said in the literature is not right about infinite sets. For example, an alternative expansion consistency thing uh, condition is called the superset property, mm -hmm. which says that if you expand the set of alternatives and what's chosen in the big set is a subset of the small set, the two choice sets have to be equal. Mm -hmm. That's necessary for quasi-transitive rationality on a finite set. It's not um, on an infinite set, uh, which is okay. contradicts what uh, Blair Borg, Kelly, and Suzumura say in their 76 Jet article. But anyway, so oh, that's just a technical point to be, be careful about um, uh, if, you, if you do start considering choosing out of infinite sets. But right. um, the other part of my question is, uh, what, what about some of these other expansion consistency conditions? Like the one I just mm -hmm. mentioned isn't very natural when you're going to look at binary versions of them, uh, but mm -hmm. there's others around. Have you explored them at all? Um, not, 
not really. I mean, we, we've explored weakenings of um, uh, what we call stability for winners. Um, that's in a, in a um, or a, a strengthening, it depends how you think about it, um, uh, which what we call immunity to spoilers. So um, this is where um, if you're a winner without uh, 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 being in the election um, and you're strictly and um, you're strictly majority preferred to be. So say A is a winner without being in the election and you're strictly majority preferred um, uh, uh, to be, um, then um, uh, uh, and um, the other thing is uh, B is not a winner in the in the new in the new uh, in the bigger profile. So B comes in and B doesn't actually become a winner. Um, then you have to still uh, remain a winner. Um, and we think of this as kind of an anti-spoiler axiom, but you can kind of think of it as a um, uh, uh, a generalization or a, a strengthening of this uh, stability for winners axioms. Um, but I think you were asking about other uh, consist uh, choice consistency conditions, um, and except for alpha, but alpha doesn't, um, you know, mo mo most uh, you, you get easy impossibility results with uh, with trying to impose alpha. But but, but we haven't looked at any other ones uh, besides uh, gamma. So yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. All right, if we have another quick question from anyone, we can take it. There's also a comment in the chat by Felix, but I think it is just a comment, not another question. He's nodding. Um, yeah. I'll wait a few more seconds. Yeah, I mean, yeah, so, yeah, uh, yeah. What what Felix says is a is a is a better answer to what I was trying to say. I mean, that's that's. That's right, um, uh, especially like in the in the context of voting, um, you should really distinguish between um, what alternatives um, uh, might be in an election, um, what alternatives are actually in the election, and then the 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 actual feasible choice. I mean, we wouldn't want to require um, Americans to rank everybody who could possibly run for president in America. You wouldn't want to require that type of ranking um, in order to to state some of these axioms. But you just want rankings over who's actually on the ballot. But then once it's who's actually on the ballot, there might be a small Smaller set of alternatives that 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 you you actually consider. So, yeah, thanks. All right, then. Uh, thank you very much uh, once more to both speakers. Um, I'm gonna say a few things about what's going to happen in the in the weeks ahead. So, our next session will be uh, four weeks from today, I believe, on the 25th of June, with Bill Swicker and Rida Laraki, and I'm looking forward to that. And the reason why we're having a somewhat longer break is that there are quite a lot of activity uh, provided by other people in the weeks in between. So um, the week after next, we're going to have the Comsoc workshop. I put the link in, in the chat just now. So those of you who, who maybe there are still some of you who are not familiar with this, but so this is kind of the main event of, of our research community. Everybody is welcome to join. It does have a registration fee. I think you, if you haven't registered yet, you missed the early registration deadline. So it's gonna be $15 now. It will be online um, unless you are very close to, uh, to uh, well, I think unless you're in Israel right now, then maybe you can uh, attend it in person as well, but otherwise it will be online. So wonderful if, some more people can make it. And then the week after that, there's another um, conference at uh, Virginia Tech. I'm putting the link in the chat now. Also, at least one person who's here today, Franz is one of the invited speakers and the program is not out yet. I imagine that maybe some other people here are also going to speak there, um, which also might be uh, interesting for some of you to attend. And uh, so that's why we are also decided not to have uh, a seminar in that week. So we're waiting a little bit longer. And uh, at the very latest, I see all of you again in four weeks' time. So see you then. Bye bye, everyone. Thanks. See you all. Ciao. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.